So yeah, I'm, I'm gonna start. Uh, okay. So chapter five is about conjugate families. Um, so I don't know why this was, just, I'm I couldn't figure out why that was blank, but anyway, goals no <laughs> for, for this. Um, so the kind of the goals of this chapter, uh, and this pretty, you know, my summary of it is understanding our choice of the prior, um, grokking what the conjugate prior is. Um, I would be lying to say if I fully understand it, um, like kind of what a conjugate prior is. Like I get the, I get like, you know, like the, the mathematical formulation, but still trying to understand it at a more intuitive level. Um, I'll obviously get to it a little bit later, um, but you know, if you obviously have any ideas um, or, or um, comments about that, we'll love to hear them. And then the next last goal would be learning about different conjugate families. So, so far we've learned about the data binomial and this chapter in, introduces the gamma Poisson and normal normal uh, conjugate families. Um, so our choice of prior. So, um, you know, the book talks about when we're choosing our prior model, uh, two things um, that we want to also consider um, is that it's easy to compute and that it is interpretable, right? Um, if you don't have obviously like, like a lot of computing power or, um, you know, or, or you're just like constrained on time, maybe you just want to like choose something that is like easy and maybe approximates a correct solution. And in terms of interpretability, um, you want to be able to like kind of understand um, like what your prior is, what the, and what the posterior looks like. Um, and so far we've been talking about is the beta binomial. So we start with a beta alpha beta prior. Um, we observe some data Y the tent that will follow a binomial distribution with uh, N number of uh, trials and uh, probability pi. And then we take our prior, so the beta, and we take our observations, which is the observation of binomial, our likelihood, and we combine those two uh, to form our posterior uh, beta binomial model, which is here, right? It's beta alpha plus y successes, and then um, beta plus n minus y failures. And intuitively, um, this, this is something that, you know, I've been, I've been playing around with this a bunch. Um, if alpha and beta are larger, you know, to our number of data points, um, it will obviously have more influence on the posterior, right? And that, and that kind of makes sense. If we only observe uh, a little bit of data and we have a larger prior, we wouldn't expect our posterior to shift. And so too, the inverse of that works, right? If our data is large relative to our choices of, cho our choices of alpha and beta, we'd expect the posterior to shift more. Um, obviously, you can see that both. I, I just decided to plot it visually. So this was an example of um, a beta 100, 200 prior and a beta 105, 210 posterior, the prior is in blue and then the posterior is in red, right? And that, and that makes sense, right? That, that you wouldn't expect your, our posterior understanding to shift so much um, with only a, a small amount of data. Um, then I did another example where we plotted same prior beta 100, 200, but now we have a beta 400, 400 posterior and that makes sense, right? We, we, again, we'd expect that with all of this data for our posterior understanding the shift. Um, we can obviously look at that visually, but also even just looking at the formulation of the posterior, um, since it is additive, you would expect that um, as say like what, right? As like you, the number of successes increases, right? That would, that, would, that would shift the location of the posterior. And so too with beta is if uh, N minus Y increases, um, you expect that, right? The, um, the variance, right? Um, of beta, you know, the variance of the posterior, you know, get more narrow. Um, so that's, you know, pretty intuitive, right? Um, but that, that is a, an example of a conjugate prior. Um, my understanding, I would say, of a conjugate prior is more that the, uh, the posterior, form, the posterior uh, prob probability density function just looks a lot nicer, um, right? Like, if you go back here, this looks great. Alpha plus y successes, beta plus n minus y failures. You can, it's very interpretable. Um, but non-conjugate priors, they don't exactly spark joy. Um, so an example from the Let book me, uh, was, Can I just jump oh, in? Sure. I want to make one oh, observation. Yeah. I mean, there, the yeah. chapter does give us a very specific definition of a conjugate prior. And that's the case. Not only does the posterior model uh, look, PDF look nice, it also is the same model family as the prior. That's the, yeah. that's the conjugate part. So you get it's a beta becomes another beta, for example, and, and we'll, so, see, we'll see more examples of that. That's so the conjugate that, like, piece. Yeah. So like, what does that mean? So that, that is something that like, 
I just don't understand, I guess, fully what it means by like it's in the same model family. Is that being like it's in like the same support of the distribution? Or no, it's the same, it's like, like a beta becomes a different beta. It's like in this case, right? Beta alpha beta becomes beta, new, new alpha, new alpha, new alpha beta, right? So the, it's still a beta distribution, just different parameters is what they mean by that. Okay. Got it. Okay. That actually is very helpful. I appreciate so, it. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so it's nice because you start with the beta and it gets updated to a new beta. That's very yeah. nice. You already yeah. copied the first beta. You can now you realize how it changes and you can iterate that as we did last chapter. You know, to, if you get more observations and all these families have that characteristic that the whatever the prior was, the posterior is the same type Got of it. thing. It's whatever it is, you know. That's actually very helpful. I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, um, I, just wanted to, I wanted to chime up with. Uh, chime oh, in with yeah, that no. observation for you. No, and please, and feel free to like interrupt me. Um, you know, still, you've been very helpful on the on the Slack as well. Um, actually, at work, we're going to be doing some Bayesian uh, interviews with some uh, some stakeholders about um, prior distributions. About um, we're, we're we're trying to like um, at the company I work for, um, we are trying to um, make our sales cycle shorter. Um, so we want to try to get people's prior understanding about like some attributes in the sales cycle. Obviously, we're not telling them that, right? We don't want to influence. Oh, it. that's really cool. Um, but I think that's you know we're just trying to play around with it. My manager was um, thinks that'd be a good idea just to like experiment with it and see what it, and see what we get uh, for like a, a model that we're um, a planning model that you know these would be inputs that we use to a planning model downstream. So I think it's you know you've been very helpful. So all the questions I've been asking, oh, um, I just try to that. like get all the uh, interpretation. So again, appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so with non-conjugate priors, right? So the example from the book is that we have this, um, this probability density function of e minus e to the pi, and pi is on the interval of zero to one. Um, this is you know, a legitimate prior uh, because um, it's on the, you know, it has the same support as the beta. And so we you know zero to one, we're good. So in the example then, we observe y equals 10 successes from n equals 50 independent failures. But instead of this nice, lovely form, simple, interpretable, we are left with this. <laughs> this kind of a mess to look at, um, kind of sucks to look at, quite frankly. Um, I'm personally not as mathematically inclined. Um, but I think the, obviously, right, this is a valid posterior uh, probability density function, right? Like you can use it and it would spit out a result that is um, correct right like mathematically so right um but the issue i think with this as the book talks about is this is not really interpretable it's very hard to understand um like when i have a different you know it's just very understand like the relationship between the prior and the likelihood um and it would also be a mess too if we want to then calculate any summary statistics from that posterior posterior distribution whether that be the expected value or the variance um, so this, as the authors say, it doesn't spark joy. And I, and I have to agree with that. Um, it's kind of not great to look at and, and again, very hard to interpret. Um, come in now, we're, you know, we're talking about the gamma plus on and conjugate priors that actually spark joy. <laughs> um, so uh, an example for the book was uh, one of the authors gets a lot of fraud risk calls. Uh, I, I also get a lot of fraudulent calls as well. I'm not sure about you. Um, oh yeah, tons of <laughs> Really wish those were banned, but yeah. <laughs> um, so his prior on this was that the uh, most typical number of calls per day was five, but that could reasonably range anywhere from two to seven. Um, so, so far again, we've been talking about the beta binomial and it's really good for uh, modeling things like, you know, proportions. Um, Stuff like what is the proportion of people that support a political candidate, or what is a, um, a baseball player's batting average, right? S stuff that is like bounded between zero and one, which you know we could probably think of many things. Or actually, in case of my work, or, or you know maybe like the number of one opportunities um, for a given sales rep, stuff like that. Um, but we actually can't apply our data prior, right? That that, that knowledge to this type of data because it's a count. Um, Right, it, it, it's just outside of that interval of zero to one. Um, but we we can still use other types of uh, distribution. So the one we'll be focusing on first is the gamma Poisson. Um, so the Poisson is good for modeling, you know, count related data. 
Um, so like, for example, this, you know, phone calls. Um, one thing I looked on Wikipedia, which is very interesting, was chewing gum on a sidewalk uh, apparently approximates a Poisson um, uh, di- distribution, which I, which I, I think like, I guess that does make sense, right? Um, but I just thought, you know, that was interesting. Um, this is oh, it's kind of weird formatting. Um, but here, you know, why is the number of independent events that occur in a fixed amount of time and our lambda is the rate at which these occur. In our previous example, our prior for, you know, lambda in this case is five, so that would be our rate. Um, we can then define the probability mass function for this given by this formula and a plus on random variable has both equal mean and variance. Um, the book also does this kind of just showing, um, how a Poisson uh, variable looks at different rates. Um, so I, I decided also to play around with it too, because you know that's how I build a bit more intuition on these things. Um, so this is just an example of a uh, from a you know just randomly sampling from a Poisson distribution with uh, lambda equals ten, and this is one with lambda equals one, and here's one with lambda equals one hundred. So we can see. Um, the as lambda increases, we get a more symmetrical distribution um, with higher variance, right? So in this case, let's say for a hundred, it would seem that you know the most likely value here is a hundred, but it is still plausible that even like values around like the tails of the distribution could occur. Um, whereas if you look at um, yeah plus on one, uh, you know with the lambda of one, um, excuse me, um, zero you know, one, they're the most, they're, you know, they're most likely values and really anything after like, five, like you could even say, let's just call that three. Um, the scales are a little bit wonky, but three, it's like probably not as likely, right? Um, and it just pretty much dips off after that, um, which I thought, I think is, you know, cool just to kind of like build intuition about what it is like, what is like a Poisson with a lambda of 10 actually like look like and like mean uh, visually. Um, so yeah, so there's uh, another term. I have heard this in all of my stats classes, joint probability and mass function. I never, <laughs> I never really knew what it meant. Um, it was just something that I felt like got thrown around a lot. And I'm like, I don't know, sometimes I felt maybe a little bit uh, self-conscious about asking the, pr- the professor, the TA, I'm like, hey, what, what does this actually mean? Um, but I like this quote from the book about, um, what a joint probability mass function is. And I'll just like, you know, read it off the slide. But yet in weighing the evidence of the phone call data, we won't want to analyze each individual day. Rather, we'll need to process the collective or joint information in our end data points. This information is captured by the joint probability mass function. And that to me makes a lot more intuitive sense that this is essentially capturing the collective information that we have observed in our uh, samples of data. And what I also liked is that this is analogous to the uh, joint probability of independent events. So, you know, probability of A intersect B is just equal to the marginal probabilities of A and B, um, well, yeah, multiplied together, um, which I thought made a lot more sense to me and is something, right, that we're going to be using um, a lot when it comes to gamma Poisson as well as the uh, normal normal um, models. Yeah, yeah looking I mean, ahead in future chapters, yeah. there's going to be mega joint dispute, joint probability mass functions. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and, and for me, again, it's just like, I I don't know. I, I feel like sometimes in stats classes, you get like these like terms that are thrown at yeah. you that you're like, what what the hell is joint? Like, I feel like yeah. joint is probably where I like, I'm like, I've always like been a stickler on. I'm like, what is, I can't like envision that in my head. But if someone said like collective probability mass yeah. function or like, I'd be like, oh, okay, collective, all of the information. Yeah. That makes way more sense than like joint. You know what I yeah. mean? Um, but that is great because, like, I mean, like you said, right, I think the reason that for that joint, joint terms is to disambiguate it from things like the, the uh, conditional or the marginal probability oh. functions that we'll get to later, you know, at some point, I think. Well, you know what a marginal distribution is, right? So if you have, um, a joint distribution of X and Y, the marginal distribution over X, you know, integrates out the Y, right? Mm-hmm. As an example. Yeah. Um, I don't know yeah. if that helped or not. <laughs> no, <laughs> so, no, it did. Um, no, it, it definitely did. Um, but yeah, no, I was just like, I just want to make, put that in slide. I'm like, 
I, I don't like this term. I've never liked this term, never understood it. But now I do, which is great. Um, honestly, awesome. like, you know, they, you can like show the math, but I think that's, you know, not necessarily as important. Um, and then we get to our, our gamma prior. Uh, there's like parts of the books, like, guess what it is? It's like, I'm not going to show that. It's in the chapter. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, so our gamma prior uh, has two parameters. So we're assuming that lambda follows a gamma distribution with two parameters, S and R. Um, S controlling the shape of the gamma distribution and R controlling the rate of, um, of change, rate, rate of decrease, right? And here we have its uh, probability density function that I'm not going to read aloud, but you know, that, that's what it looks like. And um, then we have some summary stats, right? We can calculate the expectation of this, uh, of this um, probability density function, calculate the mode and the variance. Um, and then in just a little note is that the exponential model um, is a special form of the gamma where um, S is just equals to one. And then, you know, R, the rate can vary. Um, what I also like about this is that it's already immediately like more interpretable, right? Like we have this prior. Obviously, we'll get to the gamma Poisson uh, posterior um, formulation, but already it's like, okay, I can understand this a bit more and, and like kind of see where it's going. Um, then, so I actually, I love these parts in the book. Um, so in, when we we're learning about the beta binomial, um, I didn't really have like a good intuitive understanding of like what happens when A is greater than alpha is greater than beta or like alpha is equal to beta. Um, but these are really good, right? Because I think when someone says like a beta 10 two prior, like you might not have, you know, the most perfect image in your head, but if you can kind of approximate what that would look, I think that's like helpful, um, especially when you're like trying to do any modeling, right? Um, so I thought, this is probably like the most useful quiz yourself I saw in the book, in this chapter. I thought we could just kind of go through it. Um, sure. So hopefully this is fine. I was kind of playing with the images. If you, I can also increase it if it's not. No, it's fine. As does well. Awesome. Um, so oh, actually, you know what, for the, for, uh, maybe you should increase yeah. it. Yeah. Cause there's going to be people watching the two, the True. other members are going to watch this on YouTube and they'd be like, yeah. I can't see that. Thing. Yeah. And I'd be like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was trying, I was trying my best. Yeah. Um, uh, that's a lot better. Awesome. Um, so the first question is how would you describe the typical behavior of a gamma SR variable where Lambda, uh, variable Lambda when S is greater than R. So as an example, two and one. So would you say it's right skew with a mean greater than one, um, right skew with a mean less than one and symmetric with a mean around one for two one? I mean, isn't it uh, given down there? Oh, it, it I, well, no, it, it's just saying like, I was hoping, yeah, I, was, uh, I wanted to hear it, but, um, I mean, it's saying that, right, the dash and solid vertical lines represent the modes and means. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I would definitely say it's right skewed with the mean greater than one because the mean yeah. is S over R, but I'm kind of doing math and not, it's not my intuition. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fair. And then the the inverse of that, right, it's like when S is less than R, um, is it, you know, one or two, right? And then we can look at one or two. We can see that, okay, that's less than one. Yeah. Um, and then which model has a greater variability in the plausible values of lambda? It would be a gamma 2020 distribution or a gamma 2100. So, I mean, I think it's the, the, the smaller, wait. Yeah, the smaller numbers give you bigger variability is what I keep having in the back of my mind. Yeah, um, no, I, I think you are right as well. Um, I mean, we could, I could check back in the book. Um, it's S, yeah, so but, it's S over R squared. So yeah, so yeah. It's very, very Yep, so that'd be what gamma twenty twenty, right? Has yeah. more um, yeah. variability, right? And I guess you could also like kind of intuit that a little bit if you look at like the gamma two two. Um, you can see that like, right, this is like a larger um, variance than let's say the gamma one two, as an example, right? Right, right. it has like a lower, smaller spread of uh, variable of variation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I have to admit that I struggled a little bit with getting building up some intuition. I probably need to play with it some more of the gamma model myself because. It's like they call it the scale. What do they call it? The the scale the, and the rate or something like that. Yeah, it's the it shape and the, the rate. Shape. But 
but they, yeah but i don't really see how those words have anything to do with what they actually do <laughs> no the i mean is like s over r and i think of that as being kind of the overall average rate right yeah um, and i think it's but yeah i think i have less intuition i also need to play around with it more i have like less intuition on the shape compared to the beta distribution right because like when alpha yeah. is greater than beta i expect and let's say our parameter is pi I expect pi to be over 0.5, right? And maybe again, I won't get the tails perfectly right, but I understand where that is. Whereas this, when I like vary that, I'm like, I, I don't have as big intuition, probably also because at least with the beta, you're bounded from zero to one and this you're not, right? You have infinite support. Um, so probably just need to play around with it a bit more. Yeah. We um, just to like kind of get the visuals down, but. This is at least, I think, a good starting point. Um, and I, I do love these sections in the book when they're like, just play around with it and just like see how you would visualize it. Um, so now we get our posterior model. So assuming that, you know, lambda uh, follows, you know, a uh, Poisson and a gamma, um, we're going to assume right now that our posterior, so lambda, given that a vector of values y, um, follows a, a gamma. Uh, posterior of s plus the summation of our uh, values for y and then our rate parameter r plus n the number of samples um so the example in the book the author tracked um four days of, of fraudulent calls and put place them in the vector so we found on one day it was six two other days it was two respectively and then um last day was one so it's pretty easy right just to sum that all up and we get a posterior um, uh, gamma of gamma 216, um, which we can you know, visualize here. I'll just blow it up a little bit. Um, you know, and, and right our, um, so we have our prior right in yellow, our scaled likelihood in blue, and our posterior in green. And what's interesting is that um, our posterior has actually um, shifted a little bit leftward, um, where we thought the most plausible value was five. Um, it actually seems that the most plausible value in this case is um, 3.5, um, which, you know, we can just calculate the summary statistics for that. Um, so, you know, bit of an overestimate, right? The number of fraudulent calls, maybe, you know, maybe the author was like, I freaking hate these things. It has to be so high because I get them all the time. Um, but then, you know, obviously small sample data too, but, um, our, you know, this posterior understanding has shifted um, a little bit leftward. Um, but I think, you know, what we've even been learning with um, the beta binomial framework, right? Like this hasn't, this isn't going to change, right? We're, we're still getting a prior, we're still observing some data and we're still updating our priors and creating a posterior, even if it is different types of data and a different formulation, it's still like fundamentally the same exercise, um, which is good because even though we can't apply everything from the beta binomial framework, it's still like that, those underlying concepts that we can apply to other types of stuff like the gamma plus on. Um, this one, so the normal, normal, I, I will admit, I am struggling a bit more with this, whereas I can see like the gamma plus on makes a bit more sense to me. The normal, normal doesn't as much. If, again, if you want to chime in, um, feel free to whenever um, in terms of like any anything, you know, you, you think about the normal, normal uh, conjugate family. But the example in the book was um, they, the authors wanted to look at what is the mean hippocampal uh, volume among people with a history of concussions. Um, so their prior is that the mean mu is between six and seven uh, cubic centimeters, and the average of that would be six and a half. Um, so our normal model, this is pretty much right, like in every intro stats class, we always start with a normal distribution. Um, so this isn't like very, I, it yep. shouldn't necessarily be that unfamiliar, right? <laughs> um, right? Like central, the central limit theorem is everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, literally everywhere. <laughs> um, and again, I, I should also you know, say that, right, that they're choosing this because um, from their understanding, as they say on Wikipedia, um, there's a lot of like biological processes that follow a normal distribution. Um, so this is right. This is kind of why they're choosing this as their prior and not say a gamma plus on as an example. So why our, you know, our, our, our quantity of interest, we're going to assume follows a normal distribution with mu and standard deviations, you know, sorry, variance sigma squared. Um, 
probability density function is defined as that, as it's probably defined in every <laughs> intro stats book. Everyone has seen this. I will never remember it, but that's there. Isn't it um, engraved on Gauss's gravestone or something? Is that true? Is that I, just something? I don't know, actually. I, I f I've heard of that. I'm not, I mean, we can always look it up, right? Um, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, but you're right, like that's, that's a formulation I feel like has just been like bur both burned into my head, but not burned into my head. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and then right, it has these follow following uh, summary stats. So the expectation of Y is, is equivalent to the mode, right? The most frequent value, and that's mu. The variance of Y is just sigma squared and the standard deviation is just square root of the variance. Um, stuff again, we've probably all learned from our intro stats class. Um, yeah. And then our normal prior. So our normal prior, we're going to assume um, again we're looking at mu. We want to understand like the mean hippocampal uh, volume, or you know the mean of any type of like quantity of interest that we believe follows the normal distribution. And we're going to say that mu follows a normal distribution with um, parameters theta and tau squared. Um, the prior that the um, the authors choose is um, a normal prior with six point five as theta and uh, 0.4 as uh, tau squared. Um, their reasoning behind this is that, um, well, they're not brain, you know, they, they don't work with brains. They're not neuroscientists. Um, so- We're not brain they, surgeons. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> We're not brain surgeons. Um, but they're, right, they're, they're, their reasoning behind this, um, at least for like tau squared, is that they are modeling their uncertainty, right? So that they're, they're allowing for a wider um, standard deviation, because again, they're not brain surgeons. <laughs> they're just, you know, they're stats people. <laughs> um, so that's, you know, kind of the prior they, they chose. Um, oh, that kind of got a little messed up. But um, so our normal, normal posterior model, um, even though this looks like a lot, I would say it definitely looks a lot better than the non-conjugate prior we were uh, looking at at the beginning of, the, of uh, this presentation. So after we observe some vector of data, um, y, and we, with some mean, right, that we calculate from that sample, our posterior model then follows this. And again, while it does look like, oh God, it's really not too bad, right? I mean, it's really just like, you know, some addition, subtraction. It's not not subtraction, but you know, addition, division, plugging in some numbers. Um, so not not too bad. Definitely looks a bit more complicated than the, uh, yeah. you know, the beta or the gamma, right? It's just like some yeah. sums or additions. And again, I um, point out that the prior was a normal distribution, the posterior is yeah. a normal distribution, so it's conjugate. Yes. And the only, the change is that the posterior mean becomes a weighted average of the prior mean and the observed mean, right? With these weights that are given by how much uncertainty you had in the um, in each of those, right? The prior and also in the, in the data you collected or, yep. or a sand evasion wow. due to the data you collected, right? Yep. And then the variant, the overall variance of the posterior is that whatever that mass is, but somehow involves the, yeah. both, both the uncertainties, right? Yep. Um, I guess one question for you, I, I was kind of curious about this. I don't, so this is going to probably sound really stupid, but why could I not just do like a gamma gamma posterior model? I guess like, why is it that the normal, you know what I mean? Cause like, at least with like a beta binomial, I start with a beta prior, I observe some binomial data. And then, you know, obviously it's a beta posterior. Yeah. But like, why couldn't I just do beta beta or can I? And <laughs> I'm well, not sure. Uh, here, try it and see. I mean, you can try it and see, you'll see what happens is that the beta, just when you try multiplying a beta distribution with another beta distribution, you don't, you get a mass, you don't get another beta distribution. That's the key thing, right? When you multiply a binomial distribution with a beta prior yeah. and, mm -hmm. and you work it out, you get another beta comes out again, right? That's what we did in two chapters ago. And Got the same it. thing's true with the normal distribution. You take a normal distribution as a, as a likelihood multiplied by a normal prior and they do the math in the book. You, yeah. you complete the square and all that and you come out, hey, look, another normal distribution pops out. It's not totally obvious that it should happen, but um, I guess you, know, it, you, can, you can go through it and see it does happen, right? Okay. Now that, so yeah, you, if you use something yeah. else, it doesn't work. It's not conjugate. And, and like, there's a Wikipedia. If you go to look up conjugate prior in Wikipedia, they give you a table of of, of families of these uh, conjugate distributions that people have discovered and used. Got it. Well, and that would early, also be like, it is one of the properties also that like this might be some oversimplifying some stuff, but is one of the properties also that like the 
prior in the posterior, right, they would have the same support, right, after doing all the math. And if they don't, we would say that it's not a conjugate prior. Well, the, the posterior will always have the same support as yeah. the prior. Yeah, no, you're right. Because you're, yeah. you're multiplying those two things together, right? Yeah. Okay. I mean, if, if, I definitely you, just need you, you yeah. remember, There's an exercise in chapter four, I think, where they have you look at a prior that goes like from zero to a half and then goes it's with two from zero to a half, and then it's zero yeah. from a half on. Right, mm -hmm. so it has no support from p pi equals a half, pi bigger than one half. So no matter what you observe, you'll oh, never get. Yes. Like yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I remember it was like um, yeah. we said a uniform prior is like zero to point two five, and it's yeah. like no matter what your posterior is, because mm -hmm. the posterior never, is defined yeah. in the same support as the prior, yeah. you'll never. It doesn't matter. And then you get that like wonky graph where you're like, yeah. oh, something's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Definitely. Need, yeah. yeah. Definitely need to look more about conjugate priors, but and this I, has been you know helpful so far. It, Oh. oh, sorry, you were cutting off. Breaking up on me a little bit there. I don't oh. know it's me or. Uh, you hear me there. now? Good. Right. Still there? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you were cutting off me too. I don't know if it's my connection or probably my connection. My connection sucks, but it seems like no, better now. <laughs> I just installed it into my apartment yesterday. I mean, it's been working uh, fine, but who knows? <laughs> right? Well, I'm on a Wi Fi, like. At the, the border of the damn thing. That's why I turned my video off. But uh, I would just say about the conjugate prior that they're really cool, but you'll see that we'll leave it in the dust and hardly even, well, we'll use it a little bit more, I think, in this book to as a, to go back and compare to some of the numerical methods. But yeah, well, it seems like to me, I, I'm kind of not that deep into it, but it seems to be a lot of Bayesian stuff involves Monte Carlo Markov chain. So this, this prior, this conjugate prior stuff is useful for simple cases and also useful for building intuition. But um, I don't know how much useful it is like to go deep into all the other types of conjugate priors, but who knows? You have a problem that, yeah. that fits one of these other models. It's probably worth looking because, hey, if you can use a conjugate prior rather than using a numerical method, you're going to be, you know, golden, right? For yeah, and, and it'll definitely be like, especially like simpler computationally, I imagine, yeah. right? Like instead of just doing all the, the chains and stuff and all of that, um, which exactly. I know you're going to be getting into next week. Yeah. Um, next, yeah, and... For example, this is a this was a normal normal posterior. There's also a normal uh, inverse gamma posterior, mm. uh, and also a normal normal gamma one, where you also have the the unknown you have the unknown variance as well, right? So in this thing, the variance was fixed in the normal normal. Yes. But if you also didn't yep. know the variance, which you often don't, you 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 need it, but you can that case can be handled with conjugate priors as well. Got it. Which cool. is very handy for a lot of uh, relatively straightforward data collection you might do, right? We just try to yeah. estimate a distribution. Yep. It's, no, it's not that bad of a mess, but. <laughs> no, but I actually, agree. I think you also bring up a good point too. Like even like I follow some like data people on Twitter, right? And like, you know, some of them do like Bayesian analysis and very often, like they don't really talk about like conjugate priors, like kind of stuff, you know, we've been learning the last, in the first few chapters, they're talking more about like, you know, MCMC, um, Stan, you know, hierarchical Bayesian modeling, that, that type of stuff. Um, but I think it's, yeah, definitely it's still I think, like valuable yeah. just like build like, what is this thing? <laughs> what is this no, thing? This is what I like about yeah. this book because he spends a lot of time on this conjugate part. A lot of books, a lot of things, especially like, like I know there's a couple of Python books I looked at and they, they just jump right into the numerical oh, stuff. Oh yeah. And and I'm here just we like, are, uh... IMC wins <laughs> up the races. And they spend yeah. some time explaining how that works, but, and they spend a lot of time talking about why you should use numerical methods because you can't do this complicated integral when there's so many parameters and everything, but yeah. hey, there are a lot of cases where you, where you, you should under, you could use a yeah. uh, conjugate prior and why not? Right. No, exactly. Like why, why burn? <laughs> I, I guarantee you there's, fan spin. Yeah, yeah. I guarantee <laughs> you there's people out there yeah. doing Bayesian analysis on data right this second where they could be using like a conjugate prior, but they just don't know anything about it. Cause they just like skip right to the, you know, turn the crank method. Right. Yep. No, I think that's, that's a very good point. And like, for me, um, I think this is definitely, this is like very good, like foundational stuff, right? So even if we're not, I think, the, you know, what you're saying, right? Like, you know, we're not using all of this stuff necessarily. I think it's like, been, it's really good foundation just to like understand like the distributions you're working with and like the parameters and like how, you know, the intuition behind them. Okay. Um, beta and binomial comes up that. a lot, right? Beta binomial comes up a lot. Any kind of thing where you're like, oh, what's a, you're trying to estimate the probability or the, the fraction of people that have COVID or something, right? You beta yeah. binomial right there. You yep. know, come, you're very useful for at least this initial look at it yep definitely um next one so so yeah here's just a plot right um of hippocampal volumes right we have our prior yeah. pretty pretty wide 
uh, we observed some data which looks very similar to our posterior and then our posterior, right, our posterior shifts. Um, one thing I also thought was cool, um, it, it put it as like a hot tip in the book. Um, if you're, so the posterior is like, we've all been talking about, right? It's a compromise between the likelihood, our data and our prior. Um, if that were to ever fall out of that range, then you know you did something wrong, which is, I think is like a good, right? Sanity check, right? You like plot this. And if your posterior is like, I don't know, to the, to the left of the likelihood, you'll be like, well, I've done something incorrect and I should look back at this, um, which I think is like, you know, just a very good, like easy sanity check, right? Just to do. Um, oh yeah, that's, that is a good, you know, I kind of glazed, my eyes glazed over at that hot tip. That's a really good, especially when you do numerical stuff where you, you could easily screw things up, right? Yeah, yeah. So you're just with all this, and you're like, wait, <laughs> this is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's, you know, it's, I think it's like one of those things where you're like, yeah, this is what the posterior is, but sometimes, you know, you're doing work, you're trying to like do something and you're like, I, I won't want it. And then you're like, and then you just see like, oh no, wait, my posterior is not in the right location. Um, I need to look back to what I did. Um, and then this is just the ending two seconds of the chapter. So um, in the beta binomial framework, right? Like we started with, um, we'll sample, we'll create a prior distribution with some parameters. Um, and, you know, we, we've observed some data, right? And we want to run some simulations to kind of get, uh, a better idea of what that posterior distribution looks like, right? Um, we can't do the simulation techniques that we've like learned for that out uh, of these. And the reasons being that we have rare the one samples, um, right? Like we, we were observing a, a vector of data. Um, so we can't do that. Also, um, since this data, a lot of this data that we were actually working with is continuous. Um, so example, like the normal, normal, right? Hippocampal volumes could theoretically range, right? With a normal distribution from negative infinity to positive infinity. Um, so even if we were to simulate it, it's pretty unlikely that we're going to um, hit the right exact values of the data we observe, um, right? So we can't use the simulation techniques that um, we have applied to the beta binomial framework, but I know in the next chapter again, Ronnie, you will be uh, talking to us about MCMC and this, uh, how we can actually uh, use simulation for these types of problems. Um, so really looking forward to that. And then um, they ended with some, you know, critiques about the conjugate families, um, which, you know, I, I always like this, especially where uh, this is a book about Bayesian modeling and Bayesian analysis and like why it is use, why it is like a useful methodological framework. Um, but I, I do like that they are just like showing here are some like drawbacks to like, what we've been doing. So one example um, that they offer is um, some prior models are like flexible enough to um, incorporate like your understanding about a problem, right? Um, example they give is say your data um, is not, you know, a normal model, right? It's not symmetric and it's not unimodal. Maybe it has, maybe it's multimodal, right? Um, probably not the best type of prior to use, um, which kind of can be a problem, right? Um, if you're trying to like figure out, okay, well, I can't really use this necessarily. Like what other types of conjugate family <laughs> prior like could I use? Do I have to now peruse on the Wikipedia page for conjugate families and try to figure it out? Um, so that can be a potential problem. And another problem is that um, for all, so for uh, not all conjugate families allow you to specify a flat prior. So with beta binomial, if we, um, if we had no prior understanding about the quantity of interest we're looking at, we're just going to set a beta one one prior, right? It's uniform, cool, it's flat. But with continuous, um, you can't do that because it's continuous, right? We have infinite support um, of that uh, distribution. So we can try to get, you know, a, a, a flat prior by really like increasing the variance. So like it kind of looks flat, but it not, it really isn't. Um, could be a problem, right? But I think it's also, uh, you know, a good consideration too, where, um, where if let's say, you know, you're using one of these kind of like continuous conjugate families, um, you can't fully say, you can't fully specify a flat prior, unfortunately. Um, I would imagine that probably isn't, might not be the hugest issue, right? Because you're essentially assigning like non-negligible um, probability values, right? To like the distribution, but, you know, th those are some critiques. Um, yeah, I think one of the things I, I find happens is if you want a really flat prior, you just have to make it big enough so that it looks flat over the support of the likelihood function. If the likelihood function is really going to be end up being really tight, it doesn't really matter so much what the prior looks like outside of that as long as it's not like big. 
right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, that's all I have. I didn't get a chance to really look at the exercises. I'd be happy to, like, either. you know, yeah. I mean, I'd be happy to, like, if you want to look at one or two or, um, is there like some, you know, is, there some, is there some, oh, let's see. You do some conceptual do, ones, right? Do you see my screen still? Like, did you see me open yes, up a tab? Awesome. Yeah, cool. There is, uh, uh, yeah, there, 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 I think there are, um, let's go to exercises. And does this screen look good? Should I like, I can probably also just increase I'd make it, it bigger that. if you can. Yeah, for the yeah. people can you go one home watching. Um, for those so, yeah, of they, you they playing some, at home. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we are, I'm trying to make it readable, so don't yell at me if, uh, <laughs> if it looks too small. I, I hope it's big enough to read. Um, well, so yeah, I, they, they have like some conceptual ones, like. But you know what I think we should do? This take a look at this 5.1 and then um yeah because i think the rest of these yeah i think the rest of these you kind of have to like let's see yeah, paper or like, something right yeah so, or like and then you just I, simulate an r i think what we should do is just go through 5.1 and then just have you know everybody should just do the exercises on their own if they have issues with any of their questions or challenges just like start a slack thread yeah. on it and we'll we'll work it out I no think definitely that's the best way to do it i agree um oh, also, yeah. i would say even like the exercise they're pretty good i was doing some chapter three the other day yeah. honestly i'm like oh this i can actually like specify a prior given like this information and like oh cool <laughs> nice you know uh, and then calculate well, stuff i that. think that you know pedagogically speaking they usually say that the exercises where you really learn the things <laughs> so yeah it's definitely you have to do them you have to do it by you have to really sit down and knuckle through them right no, oh, yeah. yeah, and you're just like, I have to start the, yeah, it's a whole thing, right? Like starting, yeah. I read it, I understand it. And then you figure out, oh, wait, I don't. <laughs> I haven't actually put, you know, pen, paper, or fingers yeah. to keyboard. Makes it big. Um, <laughs> a bit, yeah, it makes a very big difference. Um, so let's do, okay, A. The most yeah. common value of lambda is four and the mean is seven. Um, so force and the mean is seven. What's the formulation again? I don't know. Was there the most common value? It's not always the mean. That's true. So I guess what's yeah. the, I guess I didn't remember what the mode formula was. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna go back to. The already um, right. So it's like boom, yeah, no, exactly. Like, you're like you're like I did this presentation and stuff, and it's like well, wait. <laughs> what was so the that's mode? For, did they give us that? Uh, they said seven. Wait, or is it the? See, and now we now we can't even remember what the question. Actually, that's probably help us understand what these. Um. So okay, the most oh, common the mode, of, the, the mode, mode is, is minus four, one over r. Yeah, and then the mean is seven. Um. So you still kind of do some, do some algebra, right? Yeah. So you have to. Okay. So these aren't easy to do in public either, because you had basically got to solve s over r equals. Yeah. Five these are these are a bit one. annoying. Yeah. yeah. So I guess these are not as uh, not like the beta binomial ones. Yeah, we can like, just look at it. Yeah. Um. Maybe these. Uh, just. Yeah, it's kind of annoying, unfortunately. Or all, um, already though, we did learn something. I forgot about the mode. It was, yeah. Uh, so important. Um. I'm just gonna let's flip. Yeah, like some of these. So they're always right skewed, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what I was actually wondering too. I'm like, because there was, um, I guess they all, it's always right skewed, but there is. Um, well, because the mean, the mean is always greater than the mode because the mean is S yeah. over R and the mode is S actually, minus I guess, one I guess, over R. Yeah. I guess also oh. four and one is right skewed, but like it's, I wonder if you ever get to a, like a gamma that is like, just like really, well, I guess, yeah, right? Because, I mean, you could actually just do that. You could just make it a really flat gamma yeah. if you wanted to. Um, but I guess it would still be kind of right skewed, but, like, and maybe it's not even visible by the human eye. Um, yeah. I guess, unfortunately, the exercises are probably not as easy to do live. Yeah, um, doing math in public is always fun. <laughs> um, no, yeah, I'd be like... But we can uh, see how to do it, right? So, like, for yeah. these, you, you basically want to solve these do some algebra, right? Solve the yep. mode equals four and the mean is seven. And the couple yeah. of say the mean is four and the variance is 12. So that's what they want to do. And this is a good exercise yeah. for sure to do. Oh, uh, definitely. And then it looks like some stuff here. Uh, we observe this. Okay. This is actually, I think, cool too. Um, you know, like plotting it, right? Trying to understand yeah. like what, what it looks like. Um, again, chapter three, I think it was really good too. Like once you like plot things and actually like see it, it's like, oh, this is what it looks like and you can just like do it and it's i think yeah. 
recommend, you know, viewers at home <laughs> to yeah. look at it and tr try your hand at these. Um, yeah, I, I think, mm, yeah, I think honestly, these are all pretty. Actually, you know, look at 5.15. Yeah, let's go to that. 5.15? Yeah, it's in the general practice section. Oh, got it. It's like got recognizing it. the kernels. Um, is that something we can? The lower kernel, identify the appropriate model. Okay. So lower kernels for normal Poisson, gamma, beta, and binomial. Oh, that's kind um, of interesting, right? Also yeah. Good. This is... most appropriate model so the first one the first one seems like poisson gamma maybe oh oh it's a, so it either just be like poisson it's like either of these right any of these right um, yeah got it um the first one well, it's a count, right? So theta is. Yeah, I think the first one might be. I want to say Poisson. I think you're right. I don't really recognize I think, it. That, yeah. That form right away. I'm yeah. Cheat, I want to say. Look it up. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> no, definitely. I want to say it's Poisson. Um, I'm not sure if it's, that, it's because I'm putting maybe a little bit too much weight on. Um, the range of theta, but I want to say it's plus on. Well, see, plus on is like a lambda to the k e to the minus lambda, so that's not plus on. But what else could it be? Oh, it's binomial. Obviously, binomial. Really? Right? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's P to because this is weird because they have beta in there, but it's P to you know P to the you know K one oh, minus yes. P to the N yep, minus yep, K. Yep, yep, yep. It's cut the three the theta threw me off. Yep. <laughs> no, I agree. I then for B, then maybe that is a plus on because I know within the, the probably the mass function, right? We get we have a factorial. Honestly, like you can end up factoring that out just to look at the likelihood, right? Because let the data but one over, so we're saying function of theta is proportional to one over theta factorial. Theta equals zero. Theta is one. One. Is that exponent? Is that the, you think that's gamma? You think it's gamma? I was thinking that? Poisson. <laughs> These are hard. <laughs> I know. You think that's Poisson? No, that doesn't look like anything like Poisson to me. I think it's going to be gamma. I think it's a gamma distribution. Um, yeah. It's got, the, it's got a gamma function in it. That's what I'm saying. That. Well, exponential function is also a gamma function, right? So. Oh, yes. Because, right. And then it would, yep. Yeah. <laughs> These, are, These are tricky. Yeah. So let's say. Let's go with you, right? It's a gamma. Oh um, uh, yeah, revisit that one. When, I'll revisit so, yeah. in my own exercises, but I, I'm, yeah, I don't remember them using that form in the text, so yeah. throwing you out there, then I think. C. That is. That's a beta. Yeah, for that's sure. A beta that one you recognize because, right away, yeah. Yeah, that, that one's easy, right? It's like, it's very, you're right, like the. the I told you my intuitional gamma is bad. I'm just making it even more. <laughs> Obvious. Oh yeah, and this for me, I'm like, that's a beta. It's it's on zero to one. That's how yeah. the probability density function looks like. I know that's yeah. a beta. <laughs> so, just, so I want to develop that same kind of thing for the gamma distribution. And D no, is obviously I, too, right? D is easy. So it's like yeah, D is easy. It just it, you know, uh normal negative infinity, infinity, normal. Um, yeah. and obviously you know, and we're exponentiating it. So those were easy. The other two, yeah, that is bit I guess like the first one. You might just have to write, because I guess when I think of the binomial, right, like the formulation of it, I think it was like, you know, like K, right? I think like, yeah, have, I know the theta like, theory right now. Yeah, like theta, I'm like, what are you trying to, what are you saying? I don't know what this is. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, 
I think that's, I don't know if you think that's a good stopping point. I mean, I'm going to work through some of these. So I, you know, I probably will uh, post in the Slack, you know, if any questions I have, um, but yeah. So yeah, that's a great stopping point. Yeah. Post in Slack, like you said. Yeah. For sure. Awesome. And if, well, if the viewers at home have a better answer for B in that last <laughs> one, please uh, let us know. Oh, definitely. I'm not, yeah, I'm not like, confident about the gamut distribution to answer that. I've, yeah. yeah. I, I, it's like, I, I think you are. Cause right. Like, I mean, a Poisson is, is, I guess, right. Like it's, it's discrete, but it's like, it's countably infinite. Right. Like, cause yeah, it means is, um, but. So the Poisson has, has a factorial then numerator denominator like you said but also has some stuff on the numerator yeah depends on y as well so so maybe it is that's what i don't get gamma i think maybe you would be right Unless i think lambda you're right equal to one uh, i guess with the special case that lambda is equal to one then it is just one over uh y x y so yeah you know what what's on yeah it's a what's on <laughs> You're right. Um, yeah, it's a Poisson. Hey, there we go. <laughs> for, for lambda equals one, that special case, then the Poisson distribution is just a one over y. I'm looking at the yeah. formula, so that's how I'm cheating. Got I'm it. looking at the, in the book. <laughs> oh, there you go. You put lambda yep. equals one. Good yep. exercise, though, because that really that really was uh, yeah. not totally no. straightforward to me. No, I agree. Um, but awesome. Yeah, I mean, what next week we got? Uh, we got Monte Carlo. So yeah. I think that'll be fun, right? I think we're gonna be using some stand, right? But uh, like basic stand. Yes. I do install, oh yeah. So but... <laughs> we should make sure everybody should make sure that they got you know that stuff working on their computer. Uh, yeah. Well, you don't have to do it before the next week, but if you might want to do that before next week, just so you can make sure if, if something's not working, we can all talk about why it's not working on your computer or whatever. Yeah. You know, so. Awesome. Cool. Seems well, like I... it just works, but you know, there's always little weird problems people have. <laughs> always, right? Especially yeah. with software. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, awesome. I think that was that was great. I mean, I definitely learned a bunch just by presenting. So yeah. Um, hopefully that was helpful for you to, to you as well, Ron. It was very helpful. Great. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks. Well, good job. Cool. Good job. I love those charts. I'm gonna start learning court quart on myself. So yeah, no, I, 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 wait, I, how do you say it? <laughs> <laughs> you know that's actually funny no one really knows <laughs> i think i think it's court i call it court though i could also be butchering that pronunciation um i mean it's pretty much if you used r markdown it's pretty yeah. much that i think the idea with this is um because right Ooh, r, r studio that. changed their name to posit now they're now yeah. can be referred to as posit i think the idea behind uh quarto quattro whatever you want to call it um is that they are trying to make something that is brings the ideas of R Markdown, but allows that to be used by people who use like Python or Julia, um, and just trying to make like a more neutral interface. Oh, yeah, that for is that, cool. Which I think is I was even playing around with in Python. Like this works so well. I mean, I could load it up in R Studio with Python, right? Obviously, you have to like install, you know, your your Conda environment yeah. or your Pip or whatever. But you don't have to use Reticulate which is really nice. Neat. I can just write native Python code without having to do like reticulate and load and it just works. And it's, it's really freaking cool. Um, obviously right, if you right. want to like mix and match, use reticulate, but I guess I know how to do my to. stuff now. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I've been, see like my thing is like, I always like go back and forth about like what IDE do I want to use? And I'm like thinking like I work. Right. And I'm like, you know, I might just keep it in our studio, right. Do my Python work and, our studio because it's like why not this is like pretty damn smooth um to use um and also i think it'll be better to um i think if posit also posits so weird to say that it's not our studio but um if i, I think their, their idea is they also want to have like more investment in python as well and if they just make it the id even a bit better for python like i'm I'm, just, I'm good with that and still gonna yeah. use my r no, I'm, 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 not no, I'm with you on that. I totally looking forward to that. Uh, right now, I mean, I have, I have played a little bit using Reticulate in, in, uh, with our studio and I found it a little clunky, so I stopped doing it. I yeah. went back to my Jupyter notebooks, but um, yeah. I, it looks like they're going to smooth that out. I think that's a big game changer for people that use both these uh, languages a lot, right? Totally. Because um, then it's like, to it. yeah, for me, it's like just the context switching, right? You're like, I have VS Code and I have yeah, RStudio. Yeah, and exactly. I'm, like, I'm like, ah, I'm it's all one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too old to context switch easily. <laughs> hey, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm on the younger side, but uh, I'm just like, God, so I'm just like burning out from like just picking the ID. Yeah. But 
Awesome. Well, Ron. Yeah, I'm, great uh, job. And I look thanks. forward to seeing you guys uh, next week. Appreciate it. Yep. Have a good right. one. Bye. Bye.